This show would not be produced without InstantlyRelevant.com. My teams at InstantlyRelevant.com do an excellent job at uh, creating the content, the social media posts, managing the whole process. The systems we've built to help grow a business without brand wrecking spam have been critical, and, and they're just so integrated into what we do here at Never Been Promoted. So if you have the same needs of growing a business online uh, through you know social media, through web, through email, check out InstantlyRelevant.com and see if they can help you as well. Welcome to the Never Been Promoted Podcast with Thomas Helfrich. Get ready for a thrilling adventure as we uncover entrepreneurial journeys and life-changing business insights every week. And now your host, Thomas. Welcome to another episode of Never Been Promoted, the podcast that helps you unleash your entrepreneur. I struggle to say that word sometimes. Entrepreneur. If you don't know how to spell it, write it down a hundred times and you still won't know how to spell it. Thank God for spell check. But today, uh, listen, if you, this is your first time joining, thank you so much. We take uh, the lessons and journeys of entrepreneurs and we help you know tell tell a story that you can learn from to get benefit as an entrepreneur so you can unleash your entrepreneur. If you've uh, if you've listened before, thank you for returning because today we're joined by uh, Chase Friedman. Mr. Friedman, how are you today? I'm great. I like when you call me that. <laughs> you know, I, I uh, had written down how to introduce you, and I can't find the notes that would come to my screen. So I'm <laughs> you. I'll take it away. <laughs> yeah, take take it away, please, because I cannot seem to find the window where I have all your your. The, the all good. You introduce yourself, <laughs> Mr. Friedman. To you, uh, Chase Friedman, or Chase to anybody else. <laughs> uh, brand strategist and founder of Vanquish Media Group. Um, you know, my my uh, purpose, as I like to share, is helping others find theirs. Uh, in their life and in their business. So uh, I work with empowering purpose-driven brands to unlock that passion, that purpose, that clarity to make a lasting impact um, in their business and the lives of their customers, their communities, the world at large in, 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 in best cases. Um, you know, I believe that every business has the ability to achieve that great balance between profit and purpose, right? Uh, to do good and do well. Well, and, and, and you know, as entrepreneurs that are out there like, uh, I think the thing I'll, I'll throw out there right now is, and we can tackle it and we'll come back to some things, but when someone's looking to become an entrepreneur, a lot of times they don't know uh, if they can stomach the long haul. So, so they yes. might be like to build a really good brand with purpose takes investment. It takes time. You can't, you know, drain your, your, your company from day one on money for yourself. Like right? you're going to have to have some kind of level at the same time. You can't have the get quick, rich things right. that you see all over YouTube. Um, so as you're thinking through branding, uh, and, and, a, and, and start me out with like entrepreneurs that you work with, and you can talk about your own story too, if you'd like to get here to set up the credentialing, but talk about that differentiating in brand strategist, because, uh, it starts from day one from a mentality, at least, mm -hmm. at least, you know, my interactions with you and understanding kind of how it works for my own business. What is your, you know, give us a little history of kind of like how you got to here, but tackle that first of day one brand, you know, what do you, how do you do it as an entrepreneur? Yeah, look, you got to ask the tough questions. You got to be willing to get vulnerable. Um, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs, like you said, just kind of, like, kind of bull right in. You know, we've got to go to market plan. We've got to hit certain targets and growth, growth, growth at all costs. But stop and kind of pump the brakes a little bit. Measure twice, cut once. Ask yourself why. Why am I doing this? What do I believe in? Why do we, why do I, we, the business exist? Be on the bottom line. The reason that is more important now than ever before is we're living in this kind of more socially conscious sort of consumer environment, right? Um, and there is more competition and there are more uh, options for consumers to do business with than ever before. So how do you stand out in the sea of sameness? Okay. I understand that you might have a unique positioning for your product or price point or service, but all that stuff kind of still gets lost in consumers' minds that are searching for a deeper identity. So as an entrepreneur, the exciting thing is, is, the business should be a reflection of you, right? You got to do a little personal development to get to that professional development. So really wearing on your sleeve, the values you stand behind, why you are in business, what you stand for, and making sure that's front and center and part of your messaging. Um, and that is very quickly going to attract your tribe, that audience, whether it's consumers or even employees or investors to want to do business with you. Um, because of what you stand for and what you mean, not, not just the features and benefits your product or service offers. Anyone can do that. Um, that's a quick race to the bottom line in terms of price. So starting with asking yourself why, uh, you are unique or what you believe, um, how you are uniquely delivering upon that 
and then get to the what it is I actually do as a business, as an, as an entrepreneur. Yeah, and that aligns to a problem you solve. Uh, and, and I think a lot of entrepreneurs that I meet, when they think of their brand, they think logos and colors, which is part of the feel and story. It's yeah. probably one of the last things you should do, actually. Right. Uh, and 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 I've definitely wasted hours and monies. And, <laughs> um, it, and I realize, you know, the biggest brands aren't, aren't, you know, their logos and stuff, but they landed there. And even then they adjust them sometimes and their taglines and other things. So focus more on what your purpose is, is what I'm hearing. Uh, and that purpose will shift and change based on a few things, uh, your own perspectives of life, but also the business side of what the customer is actually aligned to, because you might have not articulated correctly, but they felt it right. And then as you've gotten mm-hmm. to know them, they're like, it's actually more this, or you may have found a super good niche for yourself. Uh, and, and what I was leaning to that is, you know, a lot of customers, it, it, let's, let's take out the B2C or direct to see where your volume matters, but a lot of B2B sure. trust driven try to sales, either it be software technologies or just like services like a coach. Um, they sometimes are afraid of niche because, yeah. because they're afraid of op- losing op- It's the FOMO and, and talk to me about creating a brand and around a niche that is, it's good enough, but how do you get a customer who doesn't want to go that route? So talk about that. Cause I think that's super important to defining yeah. a brand and differentiators being like, I want 10 customers total a month. There's some people like that, but yeah, they're trying to create a brand that's to millions. And right. so talk about the niching of a brand and that story. So entrepreneurs can say, get comfortable with less is more kind of an idea. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're spot on. I mean, I think it's difficult and everyone is a little bit hesitant to kind of niche down, if you will. But even beyond niche, you know, niche, I I look at it as, okay, great. You're going to occupy a smaller or niche category within an existing segment or category. I think there's a little bit more of a broader kind of perspective now that we consider to be category positioning, right? Category, find an entirely new category or blend of what you do and how you do it. That is completely blue, blue sky or blue ocean, right? Um, so you're really developing and defining your own market unto yourself. You're becoming instantly, um, a market leader versus constantly trying to bite off a smaller piece of the pie when there's already established one or two market leaders. If you're not in that top rank, and you're Find not going to be. I mean, that's the point is you're not going to have right. the funds for it. Even if you had the funds for it, you wouldn't be trusted and you wouldn't have the brand recognition. The problem is it's kind of that influencer culture that you see this and that's what you want, not realizing that 15 years ago, someone had maybe stumbled onto it, but they'd started into some niche and they've built their business and brand because they can yeah. now. And and I think that's what's lost is the overnight successes that aren't really actually overnight. It's someone who really kind of grinded and so, so keep, please, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just like, I know what you mean there. Like you see these things, you want that. You're like, but you're going to need to pick a sliver of that and go own. Well, it. people like to, people like to kind of follow the safe path. Right. And that's why you get a lot of these local like companies and products and services, and they're doing the same sort of tactics for marketing and for growth. When in fact, you know, the most successful way to cut through that noise, that sea of sameness is to be entirely disruptive and divergent, um, be unique into your own self. It takes courage as an entrepreneur to do that, right? Um, to say, I'm not going to play in the same field as everybody else. I'm going to create my own field over here. And yes, it takes a little bit more time, a little more patience. But when you nurture it, when you cultivate that tribe and that audience, you become the market leader, right? You become the preeminent voice and thought leader in that space. Um, and so I think this is the, the, the number one rule is don't try and play it safe. Don't try and follow kind of what everyone else is doing pave your own path. And I do believe that you have to kind of ground and have clarity over your purpose and that story that you are telling to help guide that path forward. Otherwise you're going to be kind of, you know, there's a great Napoleon Hill quote, you know, a man without a, a, um, a compass is, is like a ship lost in the ocean. Um, you need to have that North star, that compass guiding you forward in every business decision you make based on that, why based on that purpose and knowing you are taking a little bit of a different route than everybody else. Yeah. Well, I, I tell people the time, you know, different is better. Uh, and you, you different will also define what was going to work and what's not going to work. Uh, and, and I think sometimes too, I think you, you realize your own capabilities. If, if you can't do that, you have to really question is what you're doing the right thing. Now, if you're making money and it's good, then whatever you're doing, keep doing, of course. But if you find yourself struggling, you, you really have to kind of be self reflective of, do I really have the talent for what I'm doing? And, and, and I do have the courage to, to get out of my comfort zone. Cause if you don't, you're going to struggle uh, yeah. to be like everybody else. And, and yeah, you probably make a living. You probably be fine with it. But if you're if you're trying to really grow something that's 
leading in some category of any category, you're going to have to take a risk. You're going to have to get out there and take a stand. I'm not saying, oh, I love, you know, Republicans or I love this or that, whatever it is. I'm not saying that. I'm saying like, take a stand on your approach to, um, the niche that you serve and why you're the best for it and go own it. Well, that's just right. You know, a lot of people consider when I, when I talk to them about purpose, they think, oh, well, you mean like a nonprofit or we have to save the world, right? That's not what that, that's not what that means, right? You know, I'm not on the front lines of solving, you know, climate change or social injustice, but, but I do believe in helping support those who are and, and, and want to have a greater impact in the world and helping them develop their, their purpose, their mission, their strategy. Um, and it could be as intimate as improving the lives of your, your team and your employees. Um, or elevating the, the standard of, of quality of products and services you offer to your community. I mean, it doesn't have to be anything big or existential or grandiose. Purpose can be something very close to home and very intimate, but brands are still, and entrepreneurs are still kind of hesitant to share that. They think vulnerability is weakness. And in which case, and, and, and I, I tend to disagree. I think people are buying on emotion first and logic second to back it up. So. People are no longer buying what they would traditionally look at simply for features or benefits or specs. It's an identity, right? How does this person or this business or their product or service align with my values? And how does that help me achieve my goals, elevating my status or my, my, you know, whatever I'm seeking to overcome my problems? Um, and you got to get vulnerable to do that. Yeah. Well, exactly. And so, uh, just back up a second too, because I, I know we jumped into it. How did you get your company started and how'd you land in this space? Great question. Uh, <laughs> I think it was a matter of, you know, being a little bit of a round peg in a square hole, working for previous companies, corporations where I wasn't feeling fully fulfilled um, by the work that I was doing. Um, I, a little bit of stubbornness, perhaps, which I think a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, feel, hey, I can do a little bit better right? Than what I'm seeing out there in the marketplace. Um, I don't come from a branding and marketing background. I come from a filmmaking background, storytelling. Um, and I, and I always knew that I loved the ability of story to influence people's hearts and minds and emotions. And I think the same is whether you do it for film and TV or whether you do it for brands. And so taking that same methodology and that same uh, passion for storytelling into brands, um, really just beginning to Quite frankly, it was saying yes to a lot of different new projects I hadn't done before and learning as I go. Very bootstrap, grassroots sort of mentality to build my business. Um, but very quickly learned that, you know, this is not rocket science. Um, if anything, it, you know, we need to simplify and clarify the messages businesses are telling to be able to better reach their customers. Um, so that's kind of my path, um, was a little bit out of, uh, um, feeling the need to honor a greater, purpose and a greater calling of what I wanted to do in the world. How, how do you think, uh, so even like, even when you sell to a, a company, you're selling to a group of people yeah. and there's an emotional maybe connection that allows you the next piece, but you're going to need business logic processes in place to sell companies because everyone's got to defend their jobs and their in group think and all the things that happen with that. How important though, either it be, you know, you're selling right to another human or to a group, to a company is personal brand tied to your corporate brand, even if maybe you don't own the company. So, so like, so if you're the company owner and you're looking down at your, your people that are out there promoting, how, clo how, how important is the personal brand story in the whole uh, mix of just branding and, and strategy? I think itself? it's, I think it's so intertwined and I work with a lot of CEOs, founders, heads of co companies that we start with our personal brand kind of first and foremost. And it really does help in, inspire a lot of uh, the brand use case. You know, when you go on LinkedIn, for example, you know, we're not necessarily following or engaging with kind of the business brand pages. We're, we're, we're engaging with the individual on behalf of that business or that brand. Right. So, you know, obviously a, a person on behalf of a brand, whether it's a, whether it's the business owner or a salesperson or anyone, you know, we want them to be, um, their best brand ambassadors. So it's important to get your own internal team and of course yourself to buy into what is that purpose? What is that vision? If your own team members and your own people aren't kind of, um, espousing that same goal, that same mission, that same drive, it's going to fall flat in terms of your customers, but they need to put, but you need to put your own personal spin on it. Why does it matter to you? Right. To you, what gives you joy and, and, um, and passion for the work that you do? So I think building a personal brand is paramount today. And you see a lot of people doing it. And I don't mean becoming an influencer. I mean, just having a point of view and being able to articulate it. Well, and maybe expand this. So, uh, just cause I think this comes up a lot and it'll be, you know, probably fast forward three years. These, these answers might be like, duh. But tell me where AI and technology maybe are enabling and hurting 
and that's in, in branding. Yeah, look, I think AI um, is doing uh, quite a few different wonderful things, but in the right hands. Um, and I think that's key, right? In the right context and the right use cases. Um, it can be a great tool to help you get over that sort of blank page fear. What do I write? How do I say it? What do I, you know, uh, doing that initial research, it can curate some really good initial kind of uh, jumpstarting information for you. But keep in mind, that's kind of a regurgitation of kind of the commonplace language rhetoric information that everybody has access to. So you can't just leave it at that. You have to be able to shape it with your own sensibilities, your own personality, your own voice. So using it as kind of a baseline, as kind of a rough draft, if you will, um, whether it's generating content or copy um, is totally fine. But it can't end there. You need to breathe life into it. Um, AI is not going, I don't care which platform you use, and I've tried a lot. It's not going to get you over that hurdle that's really speaking from a truly humanistic individual level on a one to one basis, which is how you need to communicate today, whether it's with a colleague, a peer, a boss, a consumer. Let me take a, just a quick break to acknowledge one thing. I really want to thank my team at instantlyrelevant.com for producing this show and all the content that the guest gets and all the social media that's provided after the show as well. Without my team at instantlyrelevant.com, this show wouldn't be where it is. It wouldn't be uh, what it is. So I really thank them and anybody who really needs help with social media, LinkedIn specifically, uh, or your website and and email, check out instantlyrelevant.com and see if they can do the same for you. All of it. Yeah. And, and I, I've said this before, like the, what you don't realize is the gap between people who already knew what they were doing and you, you don't realize how much better, you know, people are better at it than you, but all you realize now when you're using these technologies is that your perceived goodness or how great you are at something has gone up tremendously quickly. And you're like, cause you're, you're looking at the perspective of how I was. And if you're no better at it, you're just using AI to kind of do it faster or kind of improve it. You are getting exponentially behind the people who know already knew what they were doing because now they could do so much more with it right and and you don't have that perspective of now i'm oh i'm getting so much better and you wonder why your content's not good and you're why your brand's not taking off or you're becoming an influencer is because you still weren't you're not good enough to rework because you haven't really done the hard work of what we described earlier which is what is it you're doing what niche do you serve what where is your mission around something that people can get behind as opposed to just spewing out a bunch of you know, things. And I'll give you a personal example. So instantly relevant, we start off, we did too much. <laughs> we served too many and we did it all uh, because we're an agency. And I yeah. was like uh, about a, a year and a half ago here in December of 2023, so almost two years ago, uh, after our first year of doing that, I said, you know what? 99% of our customers are coming via LinkedIn. We really know LinkedIn. And I was trying to get my head around, can I just niche around LinkedIn as a starting point? Or actually as a business. And I was like, the, at the very least, it's a starting point. And, and, and that's, I was like, you know what? It's 720 some million users on LinkedIn. I think that's probably a safe bet. Um, and so we did that. We just said like over the next, the year after that, which is 2022, we just niched in and said, Hey, let's figure out LinkedIn. Perfect. Let's come up with the systems. We did that in 2023 and it being a fantastic year because all that work in 2022 of customer interactions and niching down the, when we did that, everything that we do behind the scenes, websites and email that blew up, that got much better. Yeah. Because we fixed on what we do first, which is people come to us to stop guessing on LinkedIn. So when you see this in other brands, do you have any examples like that where you're like, hey, they did this? And then, you know, because I think that helps people visualize, is it just bullshit or or does it really work? And I know for personally, it's for us, but that might sound self-serving. So what, what have you said? No, I mean, I'm in, I'm in the same boat. Um, me, my kind of being went to the same course. You know, when I started out, it was serving just about anyone and everyone, right? And we were getting over diversified. Um, just because we could, you know, doesn't mean we should. So we were, I was suffering from a little bit of identity crisis around the business was driving me and us versus right. us driving the business based on what clients and referrals were coming in. And I get it. When you're starting a new business, sometimes you have to say yes to things that aren't perfectly aligned. You kind of keep the lights on, get cash, you know, revenue in the door. Um, but for me, it took it took a real wake up call, almost hitting rock bottom in terms of we went from almost our our highest peak in terms of revenue and clients to almost being wiped out within a series of three to six months. And instead of kind of, you know, shutting it down, I, I had to take a look in the mirror and say, OK, what are the types of 
clients and projects that give me the most joy and I feel have the most impact for our clients, right? And that's kind of where this purpose-driven sort of mindset and mentality came from. Now, it's not exclusive to a certain vertical or niche or platform like you mentioned, but it is a bit of a qualifier, right? You know, entrepreneurs that are wanting to do good and do well, not just make a quick buck. Um, and so that really quickly helped manifest and attract and qualify or disqualify better kind of more divine aligned clients that I enjoy working with, deliver better results for, um, and I think are just kind of ambassadors of, you know, that pay it forward mentality. How can we help others in our industry kind of do the same? Um, but yeah, I mean, don't wait for your business to kind of hit rock bottom to, to make that shift. Um, be proactive in, in terms of who you want to serve and, and, and what niche they exist in. I'll take example from ours. So I like to do these examples when in my own journey. It's just kind of like when I did in the book, right? It's like you learn things along the way and I wrote about it. So uh, a year ago uh, at the end of kind of figuring out what we were going to do for 2023 and knowing that we were going to niche down, I looked at our current, and we were highest monthly revenue at that point. We were growing every month. I looked at it in November going, I think we're going to lose a bunch of customers because hmm. these customers have this kind of mentality. Yeah. Like they were buying and for these reasons. And I felt like th- it was a fickle group that was just a lot of them were going to leave. And the ones that didn't leave were buying a slightly different product that was much more aligned to what we we're doing. Sure enough, we lost like 80% of our customers between November and in the end of the year because they were all going to try something new, which was more right. just not longer term. But also, we didn't have the service or product to kind of say, hey, we're going to take you on that journey. So what you described was happy, you know, you send the investor letter out, whatever it is, it says, Hey, listen, we have our highest revenues. All of a sudden you're like, Oh, January one hits. And you're like, I'm so glad I have a line of credit to pay people. Uh, because you're like, but you're, so you make these pivots in the middle of, of a really good sales cycle. And you, and you, you know, then you come back the next year and you've doubled revenue and four X profitability. Right. And that's what we did. And, and, and it was, and the customers are happy They're I don't want to say stickier. They're just getting more value. Uh, out yeah. of it. Um, and the price points, it has a higher investment, higher value though. But we changed the customer base because I knew we had to because I didn't want to every gen- November, December have to go chase building a whole year's worth of customers just to lose them in November, December, because that's their mentality was fiscal as opposed to three years out, five years out. Yeah, no, I mean, we I, had to it, change our brand around that, too, from, from to tie it back because we had to be the brand more strategy company, the, the system you put in place, not the lead you're going to get. Yeah, I'm sure. Look, and I'm sure that's obviously stabilized, you know, your your company for for sustainable growth. Well, right? as much as you can stabilize as an entrepreneur, you know how it is. You cry. Yeah, exactly. Day. It's still the roller coaster. Day to day. Right? Is it gonna all, are they all leaving? I don't know. So we're almost through December. Can we get to January? Yeah, but it gets you away from, you know, the whole Pareto principle, you know, conundrum where it's like, okay, you know, 80% of your revenue is coming from 20% of your clients, right? Okay, well, great. Well, if you lose one or two clients, you take a big hit. Um, if anything, it's kind of leveling the playing field so that hopefully you're more, it sounds like you're, you're have better expertise and understanding and knowledge of the core singular focus that you do focus on now. And therefore it's more robust and foolproof. Um, it's not kind of constantly reaching for the next new thing that we think our customers need. It's how we can best serve our customers. What we yeah, do. absolutely. And and I think that's the lesson here as entrepreneurs listen is uh, I still struggle with trying the next thing and, and to get a, to get us to get bigger customers. We've had to go take what we've taken our initial tip of spear, which is LinkedIn and said, yeah, here's the other things. This is the, these are the components should we talk about bringing those in, which is a risk for our company because because we were there already once and I did enjoy it. But I also know that's the place to the much bigger customer and the, the higher value served. Uh, so we're going to go in 2024 and, and try that market again using the tip of spear backing into the value statements. Um, and if it goes well, that's great because that's when you'll get much higher revenues, better service for customers. And then, like you said, destabilizing because you have multiple larger customers um, with it. Uh, but as you look at your, your own business, sometimes you got to pull back because you're just not ready. Uh, and I found I, I I can sell. I got it out there, and I'm like, oh wait, shit, we're delivering that like crap. That's killing my brands. So we stopped doing it. Um, yeah, so it, that's well, why if you're operating from a position of strength, right? A stronger kind of foundation, and which to then you know have a clear identity, have a clear value proposition, and kind of you know driver. Where yeah, it does probably make sense to explore different areas that still honor that same commitment to your clients. Um, you got to innovate, right? You can't just remain stagnant. Right. But it sounds like you're operating from a position of strength versus doing oak, you know, a jack of all trades, master of none, doing a, a variety of things, just yeah, average. chasing revenue, <laughs> right? People chasing revenue. Yes which, yeah, yeah. yeah and, we've and, all been doing that. I bring that up from our discussion because what I identified, I think the lesson here is though we were selling bigger deals, we were struggling to deliver them. And it, it resulted in what we mm. started off as good relationships. A few got burnt 
not because we did something wrong. We just couldn't deliver what we said. And, and it was because we just weren't ready. Uh, and even, you know, coming back into that market a little bit at the end of this year and next year, it's a risk, but I, I'm, I know how to manage it a lot better by expectations and getting better partners for some of the delivery pieces. So the, the lesson being is recognize when you're wrecking your brand, not only yeah. just for the business a little bit or personal, you're chipping away at it. Uh, stop that. And, and one of the examples I tell people is stop automating your outreach with sequencing because people are associating you personally and your business with spam. Uh, right. and, 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 and you're just, you're draining your personal brand at that point. So I know what's your take on that. I'd like, I, I know I set that up and you can argue with me on that a little bit, but if you like, but don't, yeah, do I, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that I don't, I don't like to deploy any sort of marketing tactics that I wouldn't want to receive myself. Right. Great when idea. I get, and I'm getting more than ever before, just cold, blind, impersonal. And some of them are even. They're trying. They're, they're a little falsely bit better. personal, though. That's they're falsely problem. personal. I stumbled right? upon like, your 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 LinkedIn profile is my favorite. It's like almost you like you know, I was breathing out. in the window of your home, right? Just have to be walking by. I see that you worked for X, and now you do Y, right? It's like okay, great. You you put kind of a customized filter in there. You let AI do its thing. But at the same at the same point, I can't tell you how many emails I I open with. Hey, quick question for you, right? Like the most o- commonly overused entry point, and yet people are still using it. So all that to say is, you know, I'm all about simplification. We're getting bombarded with more marketing messages than ever before, um, and it's all white noise. And our brains are wired to filter that out, right? You're not going to penetrate with those types of messages. You're going to get filtered out, like you said, be kind of considered and treated and labeled as spam. So how can you do you know, uh, more with less? How can you be a bit more intentional with the platforms, the channels, the communications, the messages that you do deploy to a more targeted niche tribe sort of category and audience? Um, Yeah, it's it's frustrating because it's not going to let up anytime soon. I think everyone's jumping on the bandwagon of mass cold email or SMS outreach, um, you know, spamming sort of tactics because, they feel like they have to keep up. But if you can be more surgical with that, I think you can have a lot more success. Well, exactly. So we use automation email, but it's from people we've already interacted with. We have an SMS yeah. program coming out, but it's going to be people we've interacted with. Uh, I'll Great. It's not cold and never heard from you before. Right. right. Well, I'm okay with a cold email outreach. If it works uh, to some degree, it like, depends on what you're selling. Um, I would actually tell you in all cases, if you can do it, walk the walk. So if you're selling... Um, if you're selling whatever, like SEO services, get people sure. through SEO. If if you're selling, you know, um, leadership coaching through motivation and stuff like that, get content that motivated me. Like like do things that sell your brand through what you do. Amen. Uh, walk the walk with it, and 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 I think then you're at least defendable of why you reached out because they had interest and in, in stuff. So that we, I know we coach uh, people how to do this stuff. That's the the idea is create relevance for a very specific niche of people. Uh, it, you know, this time I always like to let people like, you know, like the guests, you know, guys is, you you know, tell me who should contact you and why and, and how they like, what would be a next step if they really like someone's like, I want to know, get to the contact part, like of, I want someone to come help me with my brand as a strategist. Yeah. What, what do they do? What, to give them a little uh, just next step of what to go do. Yeah. I mean, so I'll tell you the pain points. It's it's at any stage of the journey as an entrepreneur or business owner, it's, you know, we, we are kind of feeling stuck. We're feeling overwhelmed. We're feeling stagnant. We're not getting that sustainable growth. We're not really, we haven't seen results from other marketers or marketing agencies that we've worked with, right? There's a little bit of that breach of trust. Um, we need to kind of get back to kind of our foundation and our core, or we're not even feeling inspired by what we do anymore. We've lost our way. That's kind of a, a, a signal to say, let's have a deeper conversation. So, you know, reaching out on LinkedIn, we'd love to have a conversation. You can check us out on our website, vanquishmediagroup.com. We've got some great resources that, you know, everything from templates and blueprints of how to build that brand identity, as well as making the business case and ROI for commitment to brand purpose. Um, but every client is unique. Um, I just love to kind of understand where you're at in your journey, where you want to be, and let's craft that kind of uh, pathway to get there. I love it. Uh, in uh, in your own journey, like, right, I always ask kind of a form of this question of like, you, you know, what's one like regret or something you wish you would have known? That if you were talking back to yourself, someone's listening, they're like you, but they're backed up two, three years from now. What do you tell them? Um, it's a great question. I, I, you know, I wish I had... Um, I wish I had more of a guide or a coach or, you know, a strategist, the way I kind of serve and operate 
by my side along the way. I started my company as a solopreneur, um, didn't have a partner in it, right? And when you're doing that for the first time, there's a lot of guesswork. You make a lot of mistakes and missteps and wasted time and money and resources. Um, even if you're trusting your intuition, having someone who's seasoned, who has been there, that has worked with other businesses before and seen those, those same mistakes, helping you avoid them. I think having that guide, shepherd, whatever you want to call it along the journey from the earliest point forward, um, is something I wish I would have had and given myself. Um, but I think that's also why I love doing that for others today is, you know, I like helping people succeed beyond where they are, think they are capable or making connections that they don't clearly see for themselves. Um, you need a, you know, whether you call it a coach or a consultant, you need a partner in the game to be even a sounding board for you as you go about this journey. What are you, and, and knowing that, what are you doing for the future then? It's another kind of question I always ask is you're at time zero once again, and, and you, I'm sure you realize that more so than you did when you first started. Cause, yeah. But what are you doing now taking that advice for yourself? Great question. So I've got a few different sort of guides, coaches, therapists that I work with. Um, I mean, honestly, the therapist plural. <laughs> yeah, no, it's like, it's like a whole no wonder like, you need foster. revenue. You got a, you got a lot of it, bills. It's yeah. the, I mean, honestly, it's, I, I'm, I'm a big proponent of, of, uh, personal development and self growth. So, uh, there's a lot of work that I need to do for myself, my own mental health, my own sort of well being, uh, to be a better, husband, father, you know, brother, son, you know, friend, um, because I do believe that builds a better foundation to be a better business leader and entrepreneur. So the personal growth is one area. And then the professional growth, working with a little bit of kind of a business coach that, again, I wouldn't call them, uh, you know, your typical executive coach. It's someone that straddles the line between a little bit of you know, soulfulness and spirituality. That's just my flavor. I believe in investing so much of my personal self into my business. Um, and so you've got to find your dream team, if you will, that's going to help guide you along the way. Cause otherwise it can be pretty isolating and pretty lonely. Yeah, it will be, uh, at times. And I, I know I cover that in my book of, you know, you're surrounded by people who just see that you're an entrepreneur and you're busting your ass and they, and it looks like fun or they, they don't get sometimes the internal struggles you'll go through and how, uh, even like, let's say with a spouse, right? You, their, their needs and their, their, uh, pieces of your yeah. time, which you're, you're, you certainly give typically as an entrepreneur, if you can, but sometimes the money lags, right? Even my kids, I hear is when's daddy's business going to take off. And I'm thinking, even <laughs> if it takes off, I'm not going to be paying myself any really more than I am because I, you need operating capital. You need investment sure. capital. You need the sure. ability to create a business that's going to be here 10 years from now. So, you know, you're, you're two and a half in revenue. I'll tell you right now, don't think you, unless you have a, you're a unicorn, you get lucky. Just get your head right and get everyone around you right that you're going to be lean because the back end of that is a 10, 12, 20 X payoff relative to where you were from time, money, and, and, the, and the systems. Those are the isolating pieces that people just, they don't, they look at work at 40 hours or what they do in their jobs. Uh, I don't want to just talking like, you know, spouses, anybody. It's different when you're an entrepreneur. Yeah. It's different because you have four or five things you have to keep going in parallel and branding's one of them, <laughs> but it's, the others affect how people perceive you. And that is all brand. And like that is, and that's your brand with your family, with your customers, with your friends. Yeah. And, and it, like I said, so I think, like you said, I'm sorry, like the foundation matters. It really matters because it stabilizes people's perception of you on every level that you're trying to build for yourself. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. Think of it as your core, right? You know, this is being an entrepreneur. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint, right? And a lot of people like to, like you said, get caught up or lost in these, you know, uh, short-term quick fixes to really longer-term issues and pain points that they never fully resolve. Build your core, build your foundation first. You are going to, you are going to succeed in that longer kind of duration, that marathon, because it is as an entrepreneur, you're always on, right? You're juggling multiple things at once, personally, professionally. Um, and, um, and, and again, it's getting harder than ever before to kind of cut through that white noise. So work on your, work on your core, work on your personal foundation, your personal identity, your brand, your why. It's going to basically create that resilience for getting through those good or not so good times in your, in your past, in your journey. You know, a uh, humor alert coming here. So here's some satire. Bring it. I, I ran one marathon. And I know I'm not sure the analogy is right. And I, I'll tell you why. Because at the end of the marathons, where you see most people shit themselves. And, <laughs> and, uh, and it's an accepted practice as part of running. Like they just kind of, it happens. It didn't happen yeah. to me to be clear. So I'm not sure. They're... 
<laughs> I'm not sure. Because I mean, it was like, that's okay. So basically, right, basically before we're saying, you, right before you hit your goal, you still finish. You just shit yourself. You don't shit yourself. Yeah. It's two um, things. So just prepare that maybe don't have that, uh, that cliff bar at the beginning of the race because you're going to pay for it four hours or so later. Just so you know. All right. Um, <laughs> I'm going to talk here. <laughs> Sorry. That's the, that's, I think that's the I, I was laughing at my own joke. Everyone's like, yeah. Oh, gross. Like, how how to not shit yourself as an entrepreneur. Right. Don't shit yourself. It is a marathon. And it's it's okay. It's okay if you do actually still. Finish. It's okay if you do. Just but, pull it aside uh, and just don't prepare step. better for the next race. Right. And sometimes I mean anyway. I, just not going to go down that route. Just Google it. You might not like what you see. I've taken a tangent and lost thought. All right, listen. Let's do a little hot seat. Uh, is we kind of I, I always ask. You know, these are kind of like uh, little things you can recommend to entrepreneurs. Some fun questions. But one of the first questions I'm going to ask is just what technologies are enabling mm-hmm. your business right now. Mm, good question. Um, gosh, I mean, I think project management is, is one of the biggest things, you know, when you've got kind of a small, but, you know, lean team, I think having organizations and systems to support that at scale is, is critical, right? Um, having standard operating procedures for how we onboard clients, how we deliver on different, you know, services and products, um, and having kind of a master sort of, you know, my coordinator is amazing. She's kind of OCD with it as, as I tend to be, um, Making sure nothing kind of gets, you know, lost in the cracks. Um, having project management systems, you know, you know, whether it's ClickUp or Asana or a variety of, of those. Um, you know, I think that we, um, we do a good job in terms of, um, you know, I think having kind of an outsource kind of, it's not platform <laughs> technology necessarily, but sort of having a great, robust vetted team of outsourced contractors that we can go to that doesn't put too much pressure on constant overhead, but allows us to scale nimbly when yep. things do get busier. Um, I would say those are probably the two most critical things for our business um, is keeping us organized and focused when shit hits the fan. Yeah, no, you need scale. So the outsourcing partners, and, and that comes back down to, uh, this is a key thing, original, tying it back to original ideas of branding and your niche. Get your core team around that. Yeah. And then leverage partners for the ancillary add on values that you can do. So if you're really good at branding and, and let's say from the logo design to colors to this messaging to the mission, like all of it. Yeah. Hire someone else to go do the social media content creation for you as an agency or as or as a uh, as an owner or whatever it is, SEO. It, it, like don't also if you're an agency owner in this case, be careful building a business too big of a business that you're too thin on because it, you know. Then wide things break. Say it that way, right? You, you know, a, been there. Deep been there. kind of core does not. It, it stays pretty tall or st- stands pretty firm. Yeah, uh, absolutely. What, what's a recommended business book? What's a must read? Uh, great question. Um, there's a great book that I'm reading. Well, look, I'm a big fan of Marty Newmeyer. So I think, you know, in terms of branding and brand identity, he does a great job in disrupting kind of the, the expected or status quo. And he's one that says, you know, a, a brand is, is not, you know, is, is more than, it's not a logo, right? It's, it's, a, it's what your customer, you know, believes it to be. Um, so, you know, brand gap is a, is, is a seminal book. Brand zag is another great one about differentiation and disruption in kind of a crowded marketplace. Um, I would check out Marty Newmeyer stuff. Um, he's kind of a, a bit of a guru and a godfather when it comes to brand strategy. And then LinkedIn, who do you, who do you like, uh, who do you recommend to follow? Like what's a, who's a person you kind of like, you got to follow this person. Yeah, good question. Um, you know, obviously big, you know, big proponent and fan of Simon Sinek and, you know, you know, the kind of the paradigm of why. Um uh I'm a big fan of uh um you know, honestly what I do what I do for LinkedIn is I'll t- I'll spend 5 to 10 minutes each day and I will I will try to kind of act like a ghost, like not scrub my network, but go to contacts of mine that I love and trust and know and I've worked with and who they're engaging with. And I'm constantly kind of collecting new and different insights that way. Um, so that's kind of another one. Um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's funny. I should have this in the tip of my tongue because I spend a decent amount of time on LinkedIn. Um, but uh, Thomas Helfrich, there you go. There there's, you go. Yeah, Thomas. Helfrich. I actually no, but honestly, that's how we originally connected. Is I did see a lot of your content, and I think you do absolutely great stuff on there. I mean, I know you're a leader on that platform, but you share a lot of great wisdom, insights, knowledge, expertise that is tangible, right? And it doesn't feel like pitchy, salesy. It's you are paying for your expertise to others that are trying to succeed in the marketplace. So that's that's pretty kind of you. Uh, yeah, I can't tag myself in this post now, just so you know, I'm already. Gonna be- do it, man. This it's, will create it's on my behalf. <laughs> you know, it's it's funny because uh, I appreciate you saying that. Uh, 
but I, I will tell you in our own content, just self-reflective, I always feel like it's too pitchy. And, and, and I'm we always very conscious, like, Hey, listen, yeah. I don't think we're talking to our reader enough. I feel like we're, we're explaining things and we're giving lists. And, and so, uh, I, I struggle with that, but cause, cause also there's the vanity metrics that we don't measure and you're going to feel this too. Anybody who's out there. Yeah. But I know that LinkedIn's different. It's putting it in front of the right people. So the, so they're doing, they've gotten better about less impressions, less views, more impactful to people who really want it. And then I, I, I meet people that are friends of mine. Like, Oh, I love your content on LinkedIn. I'm thinking, I've never seen you like one of them. And I'm like, I know, I know. And you're like, and, but so the, the algorithms have changed to some degree. Cause, cause I'm looking at friends of mine who have a half million, million followers. And, uh, you know, people I know, I've gotten to know from like LinkedIn, we've done lots of meetings together or podcasts right. and they're getting like on their best posts, let's say a thousand likes, but with a half a million followers, it de- that, that doesn't seem like a lot. And so, yeah. so I think the perspective you're getting 10, 20 and you have a few 10,000 people, you're probably doing okay. And, um, it, and it's probably relevant. So, so I appreciate you saying that I'll tell the teams that help create my content that they're doing good. Bravo. Um, I think sometimes it gets a little bit meh, but that's us. Awesome. That's awesome. I mean, look, we, we I, I'm, me I'm, look, I'm, I'm my biggest critic as well. It's the same thing, you know? Um, and so honestly, some of the best feedback I've ever had are people that have reached out and said, Hey, I love your content. Do you mind if I give you some feedback? And I'm like, yes, please. Yeah, and they'll right. give honest and brutal feedback around, hey, the message was right, but the delivery was off. Or, you know, I think it was a little bit too kind of preachy in this area. I don't think people do that enough. And I think it's a really valuable feedback mechanism that we need to do more as entrepreneurs for each other um, and not look at his competition and say, you know, I'm not going to follow him because he's in my business. It's, hey, I dig what you're doing. Um, here's maybe some areas that I've tried that might work for you. Um, or here as a, as a potential consumer, here's what I would love to see differently. Yeah, exactly. We just got to be able to share and open up and, and be vulnerable. Exactly. So it's two, two people I've interacted with quite a bit. Uh, I've gotten to know as Corey Warfield. He has about a half a million followers on LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. Very positive individual. Like I love right. interacting with him. He's brutally honest with me on, you know, like you're this, that, and like, you know, it right. sounds negative. I'm like, I'm just being like, I'm set, my humor is, is not negative. It's like satire humor. It's, it's sure. Yeah. But things that are obvious. Yeah. Um, and then another guy's Nat Berman, who, who's kind of like about a year or so into his adventure. And he, he does really cool content with fun t-shirts by a pool. Like, um, his tends to be a little more negative and chipped on the shoulder stuff, but, ah. but it, that's him. Like, but like, he's, he's just like, if you work with him as a coach, he's kind of like a no bullshit, like get shit done, stop wasting time kind of guy. Like that's just him. Right. And, and so I, I love those two kind of guys for that. Uh, maybe last question. What's the number one entrepreneurial trait people need? Or do you find, I would say, what's the, what's the top trait that entrepreneurs have to have? Great question. Um, I think beyond, I mean, if you're leading a team, you're a founder, you're CEO, et cetera, I think empathy is big and being able to really just kind of empathize with your team, your people, your customers and what they're feeling, what they're needing and, and, and having an attunement to that to, to kind of be a better leader. Um, but I would also say it's, just in general, entrepreneur is listening. You know, we all like to really just talk a lot and, ha- and feel that we need to have all of the answers, right? Every time for every situation. And that's really not the case. My, honestly, I'm going to, I'm going to quest to try to just ask better questions, more questions. Um, and, uh, I think listening is, is absolutely key, um, in terms of being able to have, uh, like you said earlier in the, in the podcast, a more intimate conversation with somebody. You're not talking at somebody, you're talking with them. And I believe that does build a lasting relationship. So listening is something that I think I and and, and many of us need to be doing a better job at. Two, two years, one mouth, right? Uh, Indeed. You, you got it in that order for a reason. Indeed. Uh, yeah. And and I will agree with you. So I know a chapter in my book is, you know, customer feedback is gold. Um, and it's it truly is. If you truly listen to your customer, not even just what they're saying, but, but maybe what they're tiptoeing around, things you kind of maybe know. Yeah. Uh, that the asking more questions is probably the best sales te- technique you could ever have. The best means I've ever had, I've truly been interested in what they're saying. Yeah. Um, and I just ask questions, ask questions. At the end of it, like, well, I never asked, I wanted to cover with you what you do. I'm like, oh, tell you what, I'll send you a proposal and they just sign it. <laughs> You're like, oh, great. And I actually never went through what I did. They just, like, and, and it's like, how did that happen? And why can't that happen more? <laughs> but you hear them. You're not I just asking legitimate questions because right. I didn't care if right. they bought anything. I just wanted to know about what they were doing. And and, and, and so it's funny how that works sometimes <laughs> with yeah. intentional sales. You're like, oh, I backed into that. All right. Didn't mean to. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't try too hard to kind of, you know, fit in every, every great pitch point or, or, or yeah. quality in the conversation. And it's not just, I say, I say listening, but it's hearing what they're saying, right? Oh, I'm yeah. listening to you. I'm nodding my head. I'm doing the gestures, but no, no, I hear you. 
and I'm able to articulate back to you um, what it is I think you're struggling with or how I can potentially help you. I'll give you a, a tip. Uh, I, I record uh, not all the meetings, but some of the meetings we record, and I'll I'll put that otter into GPT and ask how did I do on salesy? Did I listen? Did I address? Did I talk? Like what could I have done? What, what was what cool. did I miss? And you can get feedback from GPT of what the tonality of what it was and does. And you can improve I love that. sales and what questions should I've asked. Um, and that's a good use of AI is look at this interaction and, and, and what should have I have asked to, to, to have connected with this customer better from a business. Day? And if you do that, you'll get better quickly. And I've done that and it, it helps because I already asked them questions I, that because I'll feel like a interactions going. And I'll be like, I'll ask a question that I should have asked last meeting. And, and you'll be watching people. Like, yeah, it's a good question. Kind of like we're doing right now, Chase. Mm-hmm, indeed. I'm hooked. Uh, I'll tell you something else I'm working on that I'm failing at miserably. I don't drink coffee anymore. And by the worst is I have decaf and I don't remember which was which. And I took the drink of the wrong one. And that was oh, wow. That's why I started coughing halfway through this podcast. Um, as I talk fast. And I mean, I can, I am slowed down now. Same. It, so I, it, the, it, when I get going, I can, like, it could be, you got to keep up. And so the, my goal for 2024 is not so much questions. It's more pauses. <laughs> so just, mm. And it's more, it's slowing down and asking and being more confident and less speech fast. And I tell you, it's so hard to do when you're wired to go. Um, so that's, that's a that's my fault. That's my that's amen. My, uh, I I'll I'll add that to my list of to use for 2024 and beyond. I think that's a great one as well. It's hard. I mean, when you're wired a certain way, and it it helps you with some people, but it kills you with the ones who just don't do it. They they look at that energy as uh they they pull back from it. It's kind of hard. Right. Anyway, uh, that being said, here is the final question: Are you ready? I'm Have ready. you ever been promoted? No. <laughs> yes, you can join the club. You're in the club. I oh. forgot to ask that the last like three interviews because it probably doesn't actually matter, but it's a good way to kind of close out. Things. No, but I'm, truthfully, the answer is no. And I think that's what led me to a path of entrepreneurship. Like, and I've never promoted myself. If anything, I've demoted myself. But uh, right. Uh, yeah. By the way, if you haven't been promoted or you're trying to find a job, I'll give you a little tip. Um, either become an entrepreneur, which is what I encourage you to do anyway, or uh, don't put founder CEO on your title and LinkedIn because you won't get hired. Just yeah. put the title of what you want next. It could be your own company. That's fine. But director or something. Or otherwise, you're screwing yourself out of W2 employment. As somebody who's unhirable, I'm telling you, that's the way I do it. <laughs> Make sure that I'm not hired. But if you want to get promoted, don't listen to me. I'll just help you become an entrepreneur. Thank really? you, by the way, so much for uh, coming. Uh, listen, last time, as we kind of say goodbye here a little bit, how do they get a hold of you and who should get a hold of you? Well, LinkedIn, right? You know, our, our favorite platform. Uh, message me on LinkedIn, uh, Chase Friedman. And then, of course, you can take a look at uh, some of our work and our impact and capabilities on our website, vanquishmediagroup.com. Yep. And that's uh, linkedin.com slash IN slash Chase Friedman. And the last part is F R I E D A, no, D M A N. F R I E D M A N. Thank you for spelling it, though. That's good. I E is the, is the, is the key in that. It's not, that's right. Uh, like, F R E E or I don't know how else you'd spell it. Honestly, there's a, there's a, there's a handful of us out there. So I E I-E, Friedman with an I E. There you go. <clears throat> Thank you, by the way, for for coming on today. I appreciate. I appreciate it. you having me. Everybody's still listening. If you made it to this point, you're you get five dad points, which means you can spend <laughs> them anywhere you want. My kids have millions of these. They're still trying to figure out how to spend them. You get five as well. Uh, the redeemable only by a uh, direct message on LinkedIn, but thank you so much for listening. And if this was your first show, thank you for making it this far. And if you've listened in the past, uh, continue to, uh, we got more guests coming. I want to help you unleash your entrepreneur through other entrepreneur stories, lessons learned, uh, reach out to chase. If you have any questions around brand strategy and until next time, uh, uh, thank you again for listening. Never been promoted. Go unleash your entrepreneur. Thanks for listening to Never Been Promoted with Thomas Helfrich. Make sure to check the show notes for our guest contact information and any relevant links. Connect with Thomas personally at neverbeenpromoted.com. Thanks again to instantlyrelevant.com for producing the show, all the social media, all the content, posts, articles, 
everything. Could not do it without you. Instantlyrelevant.com. Check it out. They're awesome. Once again, instantlyrelevant.com.